Good evening. Welcome, everyone. This is such a great turnout um, for sort of, you know, now it's, we're shifting to daylight savings time. We're all getting used to being dark right now, but this is a really uh, sight for sore eyes. Um, my name is Yao Yu. I am Senior Curator and Head of Product Design and Decorative Arts. And I want to welcome you to the third of our five uh, American History Initiative programs at Cooper Hewitt, which is made possible by the Smithsonian-wide American Women's History Initiative, which was exactly launched last year, last November. Uh, the initiative strives to be the nation's most comprehensive undertaking to document, research, collect, display, and share the rich, complete, and compelling story of women in America. So it's only fitting that uh, tonight we are celebrating Ava Zeisel, one of the 20th century's most influential industrial designers. Ava was born in Budapest in 1906, and she was the second child of uh, Laura Polanyi and Alexander Stricker. Her career, uh, she died in New York in 2011, so at the age of 105, so her career spanned 85 years, which is, I mean, remarkable. I mean, that she practically lived throughout the full 20th century and into the 21st. And she continued making uh, until her very last days. Um, and uh, within those 85 years, she is known to have designed over 100,000 pieces of tableware. Uh, we have over 230 pieces here at the Cooper Hewitt, including process material. And uh, I, the ones, the images outlined in red are the ones that we have in the collection. The ones that are not are ones that we would like to add to our collection. <laughs> so should you have any of those pieces sitting in your cupboards that you would be willing to part with, come talk to me afterwards. So, but, I mean, this is extraordinary diversity of uh, form, of styles, which also underscores her, um, not nomadic lifestyle, but, you know, she was born in Budapest. She also spent time in Vienna um, and before moving back to Budapest and then taking jobs in Schramburg, Germany, also living in Berlin, also spending time in USSR. Uh, Soviet Union also having spent a moment of incarceration um, and then before moving to uh, the United States in 1938. So I think that there definitely is a relationship between these sort of lived uh, life experiences and the, the range of works, but of course unified by this loving attention to detail and uh, sort of, uh, and just forms that are just so magical and lyrical. Uh, here I'm showing you pictures of the exhibition from 1946, which was for her a breakout moment. So I'm showing you the exhibition called New Shapes in Modern China, designed by Ava Zeisel. So again, uh, she is such a perfect person to be celebrating tonight because she was the first woman designer to be given a solo exhibition at MoMA. I know, <laughs> kudos to that. and. And she was the first potter to be celebrated. So, you know, um, and in some ways, that, uh, that pioneering spirit carries on the legacy of her family. Um, and it's also carried on by her daughter, Jean Richards, who you'll be meeting tonight. So her mother, Laura, was the first woman in Budapest to be awarded a doctorate in history. Uh, also, her grandmother was, uh, was also a, a, you know, a very, uh, spirited woman, so there is just something so appropriate about celebrating her tonight. So, and here we're seeing prototypes of the museum service that was a collaboration with Castleton that was uh, marketed. Uh, it was these are the prototypes. Uh, they were designed starting in 1942, and it was the first modern China dinnerware to be produced in the United States. Um, and again. Thinking about that, I've refer, uh, her, the diversity of forms, of styles, we do want to think about what she, what um, sort of the, how she was absorbing the world around her. So as I mentioned, she grew up in Budapest. So, you know, she was very much um, 
influenced by a lot of the Baroque architecture in Budapest. And if you, for those of you who have not been, I highly recommend it. Not only do you get the most amazing strudel in the whole entire world, <laughs> but it's also just um, the architecture and just, uh, it's, it's an amazing subway. Let's just talk about that. <laughs> I mean, you never had to wait more than four minutes. So, but Vienna was also very important for her. So she was, um, she, and, you know, she was there. They moved there, I believe, in 1918, um, or it was 1912. It was, let's see, um, I think it was 1912. And this was right when all these, um, Wiener Werkstätte was in, full, was in full swing, so that they arrived there just after the Alfred Lowe's house had been constructed, um, which is that building on the upper right. And there was a lot of controversy around the strict um, lines. Um, she was, she just really adored uh, Otto Wagner's succession building. She called it like a castle in a fairy tale. Um, as for Hoffman, she, you know, sort of just, she was, it's, you know, she had a very, um, it's a more of a, a, a different kind of relationship. And she referred to his um, textiles and his uh, objects as having, as being very characterized by very aggressive geometric ornaments. So, and in many ways, uh, I think it's a little shocking to learn that she started off as a painter, okay? So she was trained as a painter. And I show you on the left a painting that she made of her brother Otto in 1924. And on the right, I'm showing you a service that you probably would never associate with Ava Zeisel. This is a service that was made by the Lomonosov Manufactory during her, her time in the Soviet Union. And if you take away, if you take away the painted surface and you reduce and you take away the kind of the gilding, the, uh, <laughs> the sort of the, um, the kind of painting that you probably would not associate with Eva, when you look at the forms, but if you look at those handles, the, the handles of that teapot and the coffee pot, you recognize Eva right there. So in fact, what was very interesting was that she liked to call herself uh, a modernist with a small M, not a large M. And she was actually very, um, she um, was not very sympathetic at all to the Bauhaus movement, the Bauhaus school. She uh, admired Deutsche Buchbund, but she definitely was not a fan of the Bauhaus. She felt that they were a bit too uh, dogmatic and she didn't, uh, she felt their principles were just too, too dogmatic. And uh, the irony is that this is also the, hun the centenary of the founding of the Bauhaus School, so that on November 16th, which is next week, we are opening a show on the second flo floor called Herbert Beyer, Bauhaus Master. But I thought it would be nice to bring in the fact that these are all contemporary at some certain point, and um, that was not her thing. But, and of course, we all sort of, you know, the iconic Zeisel, um, products probably are, uh, is a set of salt and pepper shakers, which, you know, you're taking something so practical, so sort of utilitarian, and yet she endows it with a certain kind of magic. And the, we were talking earlier in the object viewing about that anthropomorphic quality, and I wanted to bring in this quote because I think it's really lovely. So here, uh, Ava's there with her daughter, Jean, and her son, John, and she says, this was, these were created in 1947 for Red Wing. And she says, my small Red Wing salt and pepper shows that way, the way I felt about my daughter at the time I designed them. So uh, that, that, at that age, Jean was seven. I, correct me if I'm wrong, Jean. But I think there is, uh, you know, it, you, it would, you would be so hard, I mean, the way that she's taking the perforations and making them into faces. So. And a lot of scholars have tried to explain the magic of Eva, right? The life force. You know, how is it possible? How does she become so influential? So on the one hand, I would want to say, <laughs> as many scholars have, it's because she's a Scorpio. Also my sign, right? 
And in fact, we are one week short of her birthday. Her birthday, she was born November 13th. And so next week would be her 113th birthday. So of course, we want to say that she's Scorpio, and people have talked about this. So we explain her passion, her zeal. And here I show you this wonderful costume she's wearing during her time in Berlin, you know, working with some of these Dada plays. You know, and is that it? I mean, that's one, that's one possible, very plausible explanation. But I think it has to do with something else. And so I'm going to tell you, a, I'm going to make a confession here. I'm not trained as a design historian. I'm trained as an art historian. And before I started getting deep into reading this biography, there was one image that really stood out for me. And it was this image of her from 2005 during the National Design Awards, which, is, uh, which, are, uh, which we administer and which we, uh, for which we organize. And when I saw this picture of her with the hands, I was like, that's it. And these hands say so much. And I think this picture, and this was when she was receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award. And, the, and you know, and you see that through, um, and I just, these hands, because these are potter's hands. These are someone who touches things and who really believes in the tactility, who believes in how things feel. Because I don't know about you, but that's how I buy, how I buy glasses or bowls. I have to feel them and hold them and see how they fit in my hand. And this was someone, and she was someone who was very committed to actually making prototypes, or first working from paper, and then having, having the three-dimensional models. And this is very important to bring out. You know, I've been working, been making a lot of visits to uh, people who do a lot of 3D printing. And uh, it, when I asked them, like, how they get into, how they got into 3D printing and ceramics, you know, I said, did you start in ceramics? And they're like, oh, no. I started, like, printing plastics, or I was a graphic designer. And I was like, what? Like, do you not have any interest in the, the clay? Because I can't turn for to save my life. And I love gardening, but clay, the wetness, is a little hard for me. But it was a big deal that um, in the uh, late 20s, she learned to pot. She learned how to throw. And as she tells you, ladies didn't pot when I started. But my mother let me do it anyway. And remember, her mother was the one who received a doctorate in history, also started at kindergarten, let the kids run around you know, naked playing. It was a big deal. So a very open-minded person. And, um, it's a big deal coming that they were from very uh, upper class family. And I just have to couldn't resist showing a picture of her with Martha Stewart, the epitome of lady. <laughs> um, and so, and you can see that, you see that that kind of sense of tactility of ergonomics imbues everything that she does. So here I'm showing you uh, prototypes we have on the right of uh, handles, um, iron handles that she did for, uh, for a commission by, from General Mills. And, uh, for an unrealized project, and then uh, you know, towards the end of her life, when she was no longer able to make things the way she wanted to, she worked with Olivia Berry, who happens to be in the room with us today. We're so lucky to have her here, and who worked with her to create um, prototypes um, for one of her last commissions in 2012 from Crate and Barrel of a silverware that was manufactured by Yamazaki. So. And here you see that, um, and, this, and these are all in Cooper Hewitt's collection, where you know, it's part of what we strive to have. We try to tell the whole story of process. So we have the, uh, we're very lucky to have the balsa wood prototypes from which um, she and Olivia worked to shape them to be the, the right, to, you know, to have the right feel. And so including also the paper cutout. So on that note, um, I'm going to end my ramblings here today and introduce you to two of our speakers for tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome to the stage Margaret Gold Stewart, who is the Vice President of Product Design at Facebook. In this uh, role, she leads a global team of product designers and researchers for teams such as artificial intelligence, privacy, and data use. She also oversees Facebook's responsible innovation and design core team, which is focused on integrating ethical foresight into the company's overall product development process. Um, moreover, Margaret is a valued board member uh, at Cooper Hewitt, and perhaps most importantly, Margaret is one of Ava Zeisel's biggest fans. So I think that's all you need to know for tonight, right? Right, Margaret? 
And so please uh, join us here on the stage. And then uh, joining her conversation is Jean Richards. You saw a picture of her at the, how, how old were you, Jean? Seven? I was seven, right. Um, she is, she sort of likes to say she's just, you know, Ava's daughter, she's keeper of her legacy, but uh, Jean is also a very talented actress, and uh, she, more than anything, she just is such a warm and generous person, and I unfortunately have never had, I did not have the, um, never was not fortunate to have met Ava, but I can really see how her spirit lives on in Jean. So, um, and so please welcome them to the stage. Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, everyone. Yes, I am a major Eva Zeisel fangirl for many years. Um, thanks so much for having me, and I'm very excited to have this conversation. I wanted to start uh, by just explaining, like, why me? I mean, there's a lot of fans of Eva Zeisel, right? Well, there's, there's a few things um, that I guess uh, made it make sense for the museum staff for me to maybe be the person to have this conversation. Um, first of all, uh, at work, I have a conference room that I use that I do all my meetings in, and it has always been named Eva Zeisel. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and I did this because when I actually first moved into the room, it was called HAL 9000, and I was like, <laughs> absolutely not. That is an, like, a, like an apocalyptic thing to call a conference room at a technology company. Um, and so I said, I'm gonna change this um, mostly so that people would constantly ask me, who is Eva Zeisel? <laughs> and I would get to tell the story. Um, but the story goes back a little bit further. Uh, I got married 20, almost 24 years ago, and at my 10th wedding anniversary, I realized how much I hated all the china that my family had gotten me to register for. And so I sold it all on eBay, and I took the money, and I was looking for um, dishes that I could use really for anything, but that I really thought were beautiful. And this was when Crate and Barrel was reissuing Century Dinnerware. And I found it in a magazine, and I thought, these are the most beautiful dishes I've ever seen. I actually didn't know a lot about Eva, um, but I became somewhat obsessed with her, and uh, used to bore people to death talking about these plates. And. Uh, <laughs> I, um, I actually, then when I was leading design at YouTube, I used the plates actually as the object of inspiration for the first major redesign of YouTube. Um, I used the plates again when I interviewed for my job at Facebook to tell that story and physically brought the plates in with me <laughs> to do the presentation. So uh, it is not exaggeration to say that Eva has been a critical part of my career, <laughs> even <laughs> though I never had the, the chance to meet her. Um, but I've gotten to know Jean and her family because I wrote this very long blog post about her and how obsessed I was with her and her teachings and how much we all have to learn from her. And no one read my blog. Uh, and so I was very surprised when I started getting notices that there were comments on my blog. So I go and I look and, and the first comment was, thank you for saying so many nice things about my grandmother. And I was like, your grandmother? And then Jean comments, this is Jean. I'm Eva's daughter, and this is such a nice thing that you've done. And I thought, these are literally the highest signal internet comments in the history of the internet. So that is how Jean and I met. <laughs> and um, I've, I've loved getting to know uh, all about you and your family and your amazing mother, and your amazing mother ever since. So um, that was my indulgent five minutes in explaining my connection to all of this. Um, I would love to spend a little bit of time, uh, and we touched on it a little bit in the introduction, just talking about Eva's family and, you know, uh, kind of growing up and, and, and what the family was like and how that influenced her. I don't know how it influenced her, but her family was very intellectual. Mm -hmm. I saw a letter where someone said that the uh, dining uh, dinner conversation was about Immanuel Kant. <laughs> <laughs> and um, her, well, they were very intellectual. And she said, I saw recently a, an interview, she said, I was definitely not intellectual. She was not. It wasn't a rebellion. She just wasn't. And her mother, who was a big influence on her, was not only a historian, 
-hmm. but um, she uh, was a women's liber, mm -hmm. and she gave lectures in 1904 about women's rights and and uh, that women should have the equal pay for equal work and all kinds of things. And she was also interested in education and made this little kindergarten. And um, there's a nice story about the kindergarten. One of the kids in this kindergarten, this experimental kindergarten, was Arthur Kustler, the writer. And when he described it later, he said, you know, we all changed together, they didn't run around naked, they changed into their gym clothes together, and he said, I knew there was something I was supposed to be embarrassed about, but I thought it was my behind. <laughs> <laughs> and um, her, Eva really began, and, and her father was a well-off businessman who owned a textile factory, a handsome businessman, and Eva really, from her early youth, was a painter mm. and, and drew. In fact, she said that when they graduated from the kindergarten, age four and five, they asked each child what they were going to do for the summer. And Eva said, I'm going to make paintings or drawings. And Kustler said, I'm going to make stories. Mm. It's amazing. <laughs> anyway, she painted and drew from early, uh, we have things she's done at age 10, 12, 14, and she was an obsessive and very gifted painter. Mm. And then her mother and she decided that it really, to be a painter was a very lonely life and also you would be starving in the garret. So she should really learn some kind of uh, way to support herself, some sort of craft. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that she was thinking about financial independence that they both were. Yeah. Um, it's a very progressive attitude for the time. It's you know not you know find a husband to take care of you financially, yeah, but exactly. make sure that you can support yourself. Yeah. Um, that's that's amazing. And so then you know uh, she gets into ceramics and she uh, she apprentices herself, right? She apprenticed herself to the last master potter in the Hungarian guild system. <laughs> and she became an apprentice, and she had to uh, mush the clay with her feet and uh, w make sure that the kiln was going all night. And then she took the things to market, and of course she learned how to mm. pot. And she graduated from there. She was, yeah, she graduated from there as the first woman journeyman, uh, for which there was an examination. Uh, and the master potter suggested that that she bring. Uh, they had some big property where they had some vineyards that she bring a demijohn of wine for the judges. <laughs> <laughs> never hurts and to grease Never the hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and she graduated as a journeyman. Oh, it's amazing. And decided after that she wanted to see the world. Mm. That yeah, so was she her traveled. Goal. She then she went to Berlin next. No, no, no. She got a job. She wanted to go as far as possible from home, not because she didn't like home, but yep. as an adventure. Mm -hmm. And she put an ad in, journeyman looking for uh, work as a, whatever, educated journeyman. And she got several answers and decided on a place in Hamburg, mm -hmm. which was a small um, uh, shop, a ceramics shop, right next to the red light district. So it was quite an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and when she arrived at that, uh, at her, her wheel, there were four wheels and three gruff men and an empty wheel for her. And on the wheel, as she liked to say so delicately, was a perfectly formed male organ. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she just brushed it aside. And from then on, she was OK. <laughs> she was considered OK. And where did she head after Hamburg? Well, she were, it, it turned out, as she says, that she was not a very good potter. That means a potter has to do everything exactly the same size, and hers were some bigger and some smaller. But before they could throw her out, they found that she could make a wonderful variety of mm. things, and they kept her on as a designer. And then she went back to Budapest and did some set designs for a Dadaist cabaret. And then she took the job, there was an ad, and she took the job in Schramberg, where she really designed for a large factory, keeping many people busy. And there she designed you don't have the picture, in a kind of playful, geometric style. Mm. She had just learned how to draft mm. on the way up there. So 
<laughs> she, that was her style there, and she worked there. Then she moved to Berlin, yeah. which was, in, in Schramberg, it was a very small town, and she was very isolated. And then Berlin was, uh, she worked somewhere else in Berlin. Her, her mother had rented a studio for her and her brother, which had been Emil Nolde's studio. And um, she uh, lived a very elegant life there she had for parties a and all parties kinds of with a hundred right? people and all the intellectuals and scientists and artists came and she, it was the opposite of the small town mm -hmm. in Schramberg. And then, yeah, then did she? Is that when she kind of uh, wanted to explore what was going on behind the mountains? Yes, I would say exactly. <laughs> and yeah. she said that everything in in Weimar Berlin was so. And decrepit and, and terrible and dark and everything that came from the Soviet Union was beautiful, the children's books and the music and the dance and she decided to just go on a vacation to see what was on the other side of the mountain in the Soviet Union, which she did. But, and, but it was hard, my understanding, it was hard to get a, a tourist visa, but she, so it was easier to either come in maybe as a fiance or with a yeah. work permit? She had a very close friend and I think he loved her. I'm not <laughs> sure she loved him. And uh, she went in as his yeah. fiance and yeah. got, got the visa, I guess, to go in. And then, and then she, uh, I, I think she had a few different jobs while she was there, but she yes, ended up... she was only planning to vacation there, I mean, to, to look around. And then she got very interesting jobs. Um, first of all, uh, inspecting uh, factories far on the edges in small towns. Mm. And that was a lot of adventures. And then designing for the... Lomonosov factory and, and setting up an art department for the Dulova factory, which is one of the biggest in the world, apparently. And then she was finally artistic director of the Russian China and Glass Trust. And then? Yeah, and then they busted into her apartment in the middle of the night and arrested her. <laughs> they arrested her, and she had no idea why, what was going on, and thought it must be a mistake, and she'd be out in a few days. But it ended up being about 16 months, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible story, which I have been uh, reading because there is an amazing memoir that uh, Jean helped um, record. And I have to say, it is just, uh, <laughs> it, is, it is like a screenplay waiting to happen. The story, you cannot make up whole parts of it. It is, um, it is kind of extraordinary, both as a, understanding a moment in time in terms of what was going on in the Soviet Union with these purges and uh, you know the way that you know people would get arrested and, and people wouldn't know where they were and you know um, they didn't have lawyers and you know all these things that we you know tend to take for granted um, uh, but that experience you know and and the recordings that you did are, are, are really quite extraordinary um, especially for somebody who, uh, was so much about engaging with life and, and making and, and experiencing color and shape um, to be in mostly in solitary confinement yeah, for that long. a whole year in solitary confinement. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it, it's kind of harrowing to think about. As I was reading through it, um, there was one quote in particular that um, I think was really uh, poignant in terms of, you know, how do you even keep yourself sane? Uh, when you're kept alone like that. It is its own kind of, she wasn't physically tortured, but there's certainly an emotional uh, torture associated with being left alone. Uh, and also interrogated in the yes. worst way. Yeah. yeah. Um, this, this little quote I want to read is, um, she said, what were my feelings? First of all, you're in a cage. You are suddenly in a cage, in a dark gray green cage without any books, without anything to do with very, very many hours, very many minutes, very many seconds of gruesome, dumb depression. You cannot survive if you say, this is a mistake, I must be released. You cannot, you cannot. You can only survive by saying, I have closed my life, I have had a wonderful time, but I have nowhere to go from here. You have to. I was 29 and a half. Yeah, she turned 30 in prison. But she did all kinds of things yeah. to <laughs> amuse herself. She, for exercise, she stood on her head and mm -hmm. did exercise with her legs. And she played, she, she kept a little piece of bread from the awful bread they gave her and played tic-tac-toe with herself. 
I forgot who won. But. And, and, and I was reading that she, she figured out how to make ink by melting sugar. Yes, and so, I yes. mean, just, you know, using tiny pieces of wood to make pens. And that's how she wrote poetry. And I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> you read through this. First of all, I was just like feeling unbelievably entitled and lazy as I was reading through all of it because the resilience of her spirit is so incredible. Yeah, yeah. There's also an incredible sense of humor in this her recollec recollections, which I just found amazing. There are a lot of funny things. This <laughs> book, by the way, is also an iBook, yeah. which you can, it's called Eva Zeisel, A Soviet Prison Memoir. Yeah. And it, you can print out, this version has no pictures. Yeah. The version for Mac has lots yeah. of pictures and audio yeah. and video and all kinds of nice things. Well, I, I want to read this quote, but I need to apologize in advance because <laughs> there's some profanity in it. Um, but it is uh, very related and necessary for the story. And I want to read it because I really do think it shows her sense of humor shining through. And she's talking about how, um, luckily, this was a time when uh, they weren't physically, like I said, torturing the prisoners, but they certainly um, verbally abused many of them. And they, they uh, tended not to do that with Eva for, I think, a whole host of reasons. But um, she would hear them yelling at the other prisoners. And... Um, <laughs> This story really uh, cracked me up. She said, unfortunately, I do not remember much of the first interrogation. Um, all of the other people, they were shouted at, and the shout sounded like whips. I feel really bad saying this out loud. <laughs> Fuck your mother for hours. <laughs> I do not know why they said it. I suppose they thought it would induce people to tell the truth, but they did not say it to me. He could not tell me to fuck my mother. I mean, he could not tell me for technical reasons. <laughs> And when I read that, I just thought, just so amazing, not only in her work, which has always retained this kind of optimism and joy and thirst for fun, um, that I think there are many people for whom this experience would have actually crushed that. And uh, I think it's quite remarkable to see um, how much she, she kept her sense of humor and it probably kept her sane. I think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the the... The misadventures or challenges did not end there. You know, once she got um, released, she uh, she was reunited with uh, family and and Hans Zeisel, mm -hmm. um in Vienna, and then Hitler marches in. And the day Hitler marched in, she took the last train out. She said, "I cannot take another trauma. That's it." Yeah. And ended up in England, yeah. uh, where my father joined her, and they married, and. And then they took leave for sail America, for right? America with sixty-four dollars <laughs> between them. I think uh, it's poignant to hear this story of this amazingly talented immigrant uh, with no money and maybe not even a ton of connections coming to the United States, and how lucky we were <laughs> to have her come here and uh, and all of the amazing work that she was able to do, which seems like a, an important story to remind ourselves of every day. And she said that when the she came in and saw the Empire State, the, the, the uh, Statue of Liberty. The tears oh came to her God. eyes. It was a very welcoming thing. Oh. Well, you know, I think it, it's interesting. Did she identify as an immigrant or, you know, a Hungarian? Or I mean, she lived in so many different places. How did well, she think Well, in the beginning, that? I assumed she uh, I identified as an immigrant, but then she totally identified with being American. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Although when she went back to Hungary to get an award, and they played the Hungarian national anthem. Mm. She was pretty moved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But she was American, and and through and through, she felt. Yeah. So when she got here, um, she didn't have money. She didn't really have connections. But you know, when we were chatting about this, I'm like, wow, this woman was an incredible natural networker. Like she, she just got out there, and she did not wait for opportunities to come to her. She went out no, and found them. The right? first thing she did, she said, the next day is go to see the editor of the. China and Glass uh, magazine and say, I'm an excellent designer. I've arrived here. Do you have any ideas for me? And she did get a few small um, commissions eventually through that. And one of the commissions was making the Himalayas in plaster for a backdrop for a movie. <laughs> I never told you that. And that was done in the plaster shop at Pratt Institute. And then the connection was made. So she started teaching at Pratt? And she started teaching at Pratt. She invented the course Ceramics for Industry, as opposed to Ceramics mm -hmm. for Handicraft. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, taught there for 15 years. And this is a photograph of her from Pratt, right? Yeah, these, right? yeah, she took her students actually to a factory so that they could see their designs seen through to the end. And these are her students' designs in the factory in Trenton, New Jersey. Nice. And um, it wasn't that long after that she ended up having her exhibit at the at the MoMA. So you know what what led to that? Talk because that's about a networking. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> she was very smart. So somebody from MoMA, I think it was Elliot Noyes, uh, came to see an exhibition of her stu Pratt students' work mm -hmm. and met her there. And she then invited him to a lecture that she was giving at the Metropolitan Museum of Art about ceramics, handicraft, whatever, a lecture. And he came. Mm. And then he commissioned her on behalf of MoMA to design this set, uh, which was supposed to be an heirloom set, the first white mm. modern dinnerware. And uh, MoMA actually ha uh, did approve each piece. Mm. She said they didn't ask for changes, but there were some pieces they didn't include. Mm. And uh, it was called the Museum Shape and had this one woman show eventually, which did put her on the map as a designer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I saw, I remember seeing an image of, uh, it was like a spread in Vogue magazine and it's this like really stylish woman surrounded by all of Eva's. And that must yeah. have been such a, just within a few years when you think about that reversal of fortune. It's, amazing, uh, it's amazing. It's just shocking to think about. Um, you know, we would literally be here all night if we tried to talk through all of the ensuing decades. I love this photograph so much. This was, <laughs> this is, this was taken by my lovely oh. daughter, Talisman. It's <laughs> just so beautiful. She is just living her best life right there, like the queen that she is in that throne. It's just an amazing photograph. Um, you know, there are so many things I think that we could talk about when it comes to her work. Um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier today when we were looking at some of the pieces in the collection is she really intuitively understood ergonomics. Like her work, it's really meant for a human hand to hold. Well, everything she, she said, everything she designed was meant to be touched. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in terms of function, in her classes, she taught function very specifically mm -hmm. that the spout couldn't drip and whatever, and the mm -hmm. handle shouldn't be too heavy. But when I, we asked her about it, she said, of course it has to work. Function is not that important. Of course it has to work, but there are many solutions to how you can fulfill these functions, yeah. many design solutions, and that's what really interested her. Well, and I think, you know, when you think about it, there just weren't that many people, uh, designers, uh, from, from any background or movement that really understood um, how to create pieces that were kind of only completed when a person was holding it or using it. And I think that's something that's really remarkable. And the fact that we experience and see them as these organic, beautiful shapes, which they are, but they're also that way because she wanted them to coexist with people. Absolutely. Um, they were done always as a gift mm -hmm. for the user. Yeah. And that's yeah. very different. She didn't believe in just self-expression yeah. as much of art is yeah. nowadays. Yeah. She believed in, in an audience and pleasing the audience yeah. without imposing on them. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about some of the projects she worked on in the last few years of her life? I'm sure there were a lot. <laughs> well, there was a set that came out called 101, and that was because she was <laughs> 101 when she designed it. And there was the uh, Yamazaki uh, silverware, uh, flatware, and there were uh, lamps, Leokos lamps, and Olivia, what else did she do in the last, <laughs> in the last year? She did, um, the right? No, that was in the 50s. That, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, that was after <laughs> she died, she did that one. Um, <laughs> That really is above and beyond. <laughs> above and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the very last thing she designed with her hands was a uh, bent wire egg cup. Mm. Two of them, one for one egg and one for two eggs. And it's beautiful. It's like a sculpture. And I have it sitting in the oh, studio. I love it. The, the felt th uh, things that uh, you talked about were our felt wall tiles. Oh, uh, based on her 
original designs in the 50s. They made rugs, they made felt wall tiles, um, mm -hmm. uh, spinning back, uh, Filtz felt just did that, and all these things are on the market. Mm. A lot is on the market. Yeah, and in fact, things. I should say, there's a brand new website that actually just launched, evasisel.com, um, which, Tali, you, were, you built it, right? Yeah, I'm not a web developer, I just have a love project. Well, <laughs> I am a web developer, and it's a beautiful website, so you, you did a really good job. Um, and it has all of, a lot of this lot information of it, yeah. and then access to where you can access all the, the works that are a still being, yeah. It's in progress. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It is... Uh, an amazing archive of, of, of material I'll have to work with. A couple of things before we go into questions um, from the audience. I, I found it really interesting, because uh, you know my assumption was, wow, if somebody imprisoned me unjustly for 16 months, I would be really angry about that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yet she, she, she was invited to go back to Russia and went. Well, first of all, she never was angry. Mm. First of all, she was not uh, political at all. She, uh, she said, I always was a tourist in life. She just observed and participated. And she loved the Russian people. And so she didn't hold it against them she somehow. Re she really separated the regime absolutely. and the people. Yeah. Absolutely. And even the, the, way sh the reason she was arrested is that there was a guy, a chemist, in her factory that was arrested as part of the, per the show trials. And he was told that he would be shot mm -hmm. unless he gave names. And he gave every name he could think of, his uncle and Eva and Eva's model maker. Yep. And um, she was actually accused of cons a successful conspiracy to kill Stalin. And when she said, but how successful could it have been? He's alive. <laughs> <laughs> they said, don't make bad jokes. <laughs> but it was much more serious than yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, in 2000, some people from this Lomonosov factory came to visit her and invited her to go back and visit the factory that she had been, hadn't uh, seen since 1936. And she said, well, I'm only going to go if I get a letter saying I'm totally exonerated. <laughs> because she was officially expelled yeah. from Russia, so yeah. she wasn't taking any chances. Yeah. She got the letter. Actually, her traveling exhibit was shown in St. Petersburg. And then she went back. She was uh, invited to come to a kind of critique of the designers there. And she said, oh, I'm way too old to go by myself. I have to bring my daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughter. <laughs> so we all went. Nice. And it was, it was quite extraordinary. And she immediately sat down and started designing a tea set with the model maker there. And that tea set, eventually they sent the model maker over to her studio to finish it. And that's selling for thousands of dollars in St. Petersburg, in Russia. Amazing. So. She, um, she did obviously, understandably, hold on to this uh, experience that she had of being falsely accused. And then I, I learned recently that she, she had this history project that she, this research project she worked on for many, many years. Can you yeah, talk just a little bit about that? she took a lot of time off from designing. And she, she was found out about this, uh, this event called the New York Conspiracy. And it was in 1741. And there were a lot of fires had broken out in New York City. And it ended up that they blamed slaves. And they thought it was a slave uprising and uh, people who were nice to slaves. And they interrogated these slaves. And 30 of them were hung and burned to death. And another family. It was just awful. And she came to the conclusion that they were all completely innocent. And it, it reminded her of the time in, in Russia, in the prison, where they were all innocent and were interrogated in this way of, you know, tell names and you won't be burned and that kind of thing. And um, I have to say her papers, her, her research papers on this, uh, have just been accepted by the New York Historical Society. It's amazing! <laughs> Which would have pleased her a lot. Oh. Wow, I, I found that so fascinating because this, you know, this design icon, you know, at, at the, you know, at the height of, you know, her taking all this time off, it really shows how much she 
cared about stamping out injustice. Uh, yeah, and actually it was at a time when the uh, factories in the Midwest mm -hmm. were closing down yeah. because there was more, so maybe there yeah. wasn't a whole lot of work yeah. then, yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, I think the, th the thing I just want to end on before we go to questions is just to talk a little bit about you and your family and what it was like having this <laughs> amazing designer uh, in your house working with the studios. Um, as we mentioned before, Jean was, you know, the inspiration for the schmooze, um, <laughs> which are so adorable. And uh, you really just kind of feel so much warmth when you see them on a table. Um, what was that like having st a working studio as a child? Well, we were welcome as part of it all the time. The studio was in the basement. She had built a beautiful studio in the basement. And we lived on the fifth floor of the same building. And there was an intercom between uh, between the two. And she liked to tell the story of how in the middle of an important business meeting, uh, my brother, who was probably six or something, called down on the intercom and said, Billy kicked me, what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> that is a story that many working w mothers can really yeah, so yeah. She, like, relate to. <laughs> but I think she was very open to us in the studio. She also gave us the most wonderful parties, arts and crafts parties, each of us. Um, the whole class was invited, and every Easter and every Christmas, we had a big class party where we decorated eggs, and then we made Christmas decorations and beautiful big cakes. So it was just you know, lovely. I just, when I was going to, you know, when I was thinking about asking you this question, I had this fantasy in my mind of what it would be like to have Eva Zeisel as your mom. And this photograph actually, like, was exactly what I was hoping for. <laughs> These amazing kind of craft-oriented experiences and, you know... Well, that was the work part. Yeah, yeah. But the home part yeah. was very, w a lot of fun, yeah. a bit unpredictable. <laughs> and um, she was a very warm mother. Uh, our, our schedule was a, a little bit mm, unpredictable. So I remember uh, enjoying very much going up to visit my cousin for dinner. He was a block away. And the dinner was served at 6, and everything was on the plates separate, the peas and the rice. And the, I thought that was just wonderful. And years later, he said to me, oh, I loved coming down to your house for dinner. You never knew what you were going to have, goulash or soup or ham and eggs, and you never knew exactly when. And that, of course, was how, how we lived. Grass is always greener, right? Grass is greener. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a very warm, motherly person, I think, as you can see from the schmoo. And... Um, for example, she invented the tumbalone. Tumbalone was a time alone, which both my brother and I had every night when she wasn't traveling, which was maybe 15 minutes of just quiet time with her, either in the park or at home, and we could talk about whatever we wanted to talk about. And um, I have to say she loved cooking, and she hated housework. And we always, even in the very beginning, when she hardly had any money, I saw a budget, a little bit of money, housekeeper. <laughs> that was very important. Know your strengths. That's also Know your <laughs> strengths. <laughs> That's right. And your weaknesses. And she, um, she, I remember her reading me stories, uh, Chekhov stories and O. Henry stories. And she always made poems for us. From the time we were born, she made little poems and sang them to us. And um, they were always had a touch of being educational a bit. And there's one poem I'd love to tell you about. She wrote it to me when I was on my 10th birthday, and it was called Life. And I'll tell you just the beginning and the end. The beginning was, it's life you are living, and life is here. It's not sometime later, it's now, Jeannie dear. And the last verse, which is really lovely, between the not yet gilded past and the time for which we strive lies unnoticed and not to last the moment which is life. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, on that very poignant uh, note, we'd love to take a couple of questions from the audience. And there's microphones, so if you can raise your hand if you have a question for Jean. Or you. I think they're probably going to be more interested in what you yeah. have to say. No questions? No questions? 
Yeah, right up in the front row here. Oh. <laughs> Who is it? Do we have Could you get a sense of what her favorite pieces to work on were? And you know, and if not, what were your favorite pieces of hers? I th she thought of all of her designs as her children. And I think she was proudest of the museum shape. That was her favorite. It was intended to be an heirloom and very elegant. Each, each commission had a different, uh, different requirement, and that was that one. And so she, she explained how she didn't make it an S-curve. She loved the S-curve, but she didn't make it an S-curve. She made it a, a straight line, and then a curve, and then another line to kind of grow from the ground, and I, she enjoyed that. Her next uh, commission was to make something very Greenwich Village-y. <laughs> so that was a completely different set. That was the town and country set. But she, she thought of them as her children, and she said, whenever I would encounter one of my, for example, she made a, a, a very cheap set of glasses, a mass-produced set of glasses for federal glass, and she said whenever I would see it in the airport somewhere or whatever, it was, it was like seeing one of my children. There's <laughs> another question up in front. Hello. Uh, when she was first coming up with ideas, would she draw first, or would she like kind of fiddle with something and sculpt first? First, she would do it with her hands in the air, like Yao Fen showed. And then she would sketch, and she would make many kind of rough sketches, many different sketches, and then she would make a model. Originally, it was plasticine, and also cutouts. Yeah, silhouette cutouts. Well, that was at the end. In the beginning, I don't, when she couldn't see very well, she had cutouts that she felt that Olivia made with her. Um, so they would go from sketch to till she found the right uh, curve, and then to models, which long ago were plasticine models and then plaster models, and then went to the factory and got a sample, and that she adjusted, kind of drove them crazy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so this has to be thinner, thicker, whatever. But it, I think it began with her hands, and she said an interesting thing, which is never try to make something absolutely perfect, because then you have nowhere to go. Yeah, we were looking at some of the technical drawings for um, this uh, cooking pot that had a spout, and she was so precise in how she wanted that spout to work that there were seven cross-section drawings. <laughs> of course, working drawings I left out. Yeah. That was yeah. the step before it went to the factory. She was not going to leave anything open to interpretation. Really not. No. She said every sixteenth of an inch makes a difference, and it does. You can tell when the curve is off. All right, great. Uh, first of all, thank you. This has been wonderful. Uh, my question is about choice of color. Russell Wright created a whole vocabulary of color, and she seems to have either morphed into or chosen white. Was that done on purpose, or was there a reason behind it? Well, her second set, the, the town and country set, was uh, multicolored, many, many colors, and each one was supposed to go with the other, you would just at random. And um, the, the museum set, of course, was supposed to be white, that was the point of it. The uh, Hallcraft set that she designed in white had many decorations. She was in charge of the first, I don't know, eight, and then there were decals put on. So, and then I have to say, uh, the set that's now in uh, Bed, Bath, and, no, yes. Cra no, 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 not Crate and Barrel. Bed, Bath, and Beyond. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry, forgive me. The set that's now in Design Within Reach <laughs> um, was uh, when she proposed it to them, she said, look, there's this great uh, design, a kind of bullseye design, and he said, whoever owned it at the time said, white or nothing. 
sorry, we're not going to take it with any design. So that was against her uh, will, will. And of course, when she was in Schramberg, there were lots and lots of designs, that, uh, those geometric pieces. So I think she liked color. It was just when the requirement was to make it white, she made it white. Hi there. Um, so it was mentioned earlier that um, your grandmother was a uh, women's liber. So I was wondering what your, um, if your mother participated in women's rights or civil rights, well, maybe what she yeah. um, said that you could be when you could grow up, if you could talk about that a little. It's an interesting question. Um, she was not a, a women's liber because I think her grandmother and her mother had done it for her. Um, she did not like to be thought of or called a women, woman designer. She wanted to be a designer. And she, I think by the time she was designing and working, she just assumed that a woman could do anything. There were a couple of times, two times in her life, when she was discriminated against as a woman. But otherwise, she didn't think of it. She thought of herself as a designer, and that's that. And uh, one time was a design she made for a chair for which she was very proud. She got a mechanical patent for it. It was a spring, wonderful chair. And it was sent to the dye, which is some kind of mold for it, was sent to a factory in Oskaloosa, Iowa. And she had great hopes for this chair. She just loved it. And the foreman of the factory destroyed the dye and said no woman could ever make something like this. And now there are only two left, one at MoMA and one in Montreal. And the, only, the other time she mentioned that uh, they were a bit condescending because she was a woman was when she went to the Federal Glass Factory where she was going to design these mass-produced glasses and she wanted to see the machine that made them to learn you know, how to do it, what to do. And they thought a woman couldn't really understand a big machine like that. <laughs> well, she did become, the first time in her life she became political was during the Vietnam War. I think that was the first time she became actively political. And she drove us all down to Washington and we all had to you know, all had signs, and she took a lot of pictures of the people to show that they weren't hippies. They were normal middle-class people also there, because at that time, the newspaper said, oh, well, they're just hippies who do that. And um, she was very, felt very strongly about that. Any last question before we wrap it up? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> At one point, she had designed, I think it was the federal, anyway, some kind of drinking glasses. And there were three samples. And the bottoms were different on each sample. And she was just looking which she should choose. And at that time, Mr. Capasso had come to pick up the garbage, who was our garbage man in, in Rockland County. And she said, call up Mr. Capasso, get him up here, get him up here. And she said, Mr. Capasso, which one do you like? Of course, he was Italian, which helps. And <laughs> he picked the one, and did, very good. Thank you, Mr. Capasso. <laughs> I think we all thank Mr. Capasso. We all thank him. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I really want to thank you for sharing all of these stories. It's, it was um, fun. a remarkable life and a remarkable um, woman and um, uh, just really uh, feel really lucky to learn all these new things about her. Thank you so much.